With that, let's turn in our Bibles to Acts chapter 5. We continue our journey through the book of Acts with an encouraging message entitled Hypocrisy. Acts 5, Hypocrisy. Back in Acts 3, Peter heals a lame man. Actually, God heals the lame man. Peter preaches Jesus. Thousands respond and give their lives to our Lord and Savior Jesus. In Acts 4, Peter and John are accosted, arrested, and tried. Peter preaches. They're told to stop. They're threatened. They're released. But they gather with others and worship and pray for boldness. Again, multitudes begin to come to and continue to come to faith in Christ. Now, we know the church was and is under attack. Satan uses people and he uses intimidation to hinder the work that God is doing. Now, Satan has so little in common with our Lord, some would think, He couldn't have anything in common. Oh, he does. He observes and watches how the Lord works, and then he tries to do likewise. Of course, the goal and motivation, the power and everything else is very different. But just as our Lord works through people, Satan works through people. And so um, just as our Lord never gives up, Satan never gives up. Satan's attack from outside failed so he attacked from within the confrontation gave way to more people coming to Christ so now the trial will be corruption within the church the latter chapter chapter 4 ended with many selling their land and their houses and bringing the proceeds to the disciples who distributed them to all in need But we read, and when you read something really good and then the word but appears, you know that's going to be bad. But a certain man named Ananias, his name, by the way, means gracious, and Sapphira, her name means beautiful, so we'll refer to them that way, gracious and beautiful, his wife sold a possession and kept back part of the proceeds his wife also being aware of it and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men but to God. Listen, a couple oh so essential things. It says he lied to the Holy Spirit and then he says, well, you lied to God. It's a reminder that the Holy Spirit is in fact God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three persons, one God beyond our comprehension. I remember somebody saying once, if we could understand God and comprehend him, he wouldn't be great enough to meet all our needs. But the accusation here is, you have not lied to men, but to God. Now, Satan lies and tempts. We resist or we sin, but we're guilty when we give in. James says we're drawn away by our own desires and enticed. And when desire conceives, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is full grown, it brings forth death. The short version of that, the wages of sin is death. And that's bad news because all have sinned and do sin and will sin. The wages of sin is death. The good news that God's gift to all who repent and receive Jesus as Lord and Savior is everlasting life. Well, verse 5, we read, Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And the young men arose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. Now it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter answered her, 
tell me whether you sold the land for so much. She said, yes, for so much. Important to say, this isn't a trap being set by Peter. He is actually giving her opportunity here to come clean, to say, here's what happened and here's what's going on. And so uh, I do want to say she had three options here. She could have pled innocent. She could have said, look, I didn't know at all anything about what he was planning to do. She could have pled guilty and just say, hey, we planned it. We purposed it. I'm guilty of it. She could have repented and asked for forgiveness because we know, though she may not have, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Well, Peter says to her, how is it that you've agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who've buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last and the young men came in found her dead and carried her out, buried by her, carrying her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and all who heard these things. I want to say we would be afraid too. God judged them and killed them on the spot. It wasn't Peter, it was God. The other thing is, and this is going to be important today and going forward, their sin of hypocrisy is so common today, we hardly recognize it as a sin. Many of us prefer to be seen as more loving, more caring, more generous, more kind than we really are. And so we can come to church well, we haven't been able to come to church, but we'll be able to come to church together next week. And when we do, we want to make sure we're not putting on a mask. That's the very meaning of the word hypocrisy, one who wears a mask. And it's so important that we process this information. If you want to be seen as more anything than you actually are, here's a tip. Become that. If you want to be seen as more loving, be more loving, be more generous, be more kind, be more faithful, be more fruitful. But don't pretend to be something you're not because God judged it then. It got me thinking, while there are only a few of us gathered to produce this service for you today, what if he were doing that same thing? I'd be very concerned for some of us, but not you two, of course. Well, then not you. Not any of these cardboard cutouts of our kids. Oh, not you. and Well, not you or you. So I, I guess I'd be very worried and you'd all be fine. Anyway, so important that we process this today. Jesus addresses in Matthew 6 this subject of hypocrisy. Putting on a mask, playing a part, being a pretender, a poser an actor, and he cites three common activities among them and among most, if not many of us today. Jesus says, listen to it, when you give, when you pray, when you fast, don't be like the hypocrites. Let me read you just a little bit of it because we have time to do so this morning. He says in Matthew 6, 1, and you can look now or you can look later, take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds. I'll use the words you're giving because that's what charitable deeds were primarily. That you do not give before men, here's the motivation, to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you give, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Now, I don't know if, if, if this is literal, but it's hard for me, to for me to imagine Jesus making it up. 
He's saying they were actually blowing a trumpet and saying, we're about to give, so pay attention to me. What was their goal? To be thought more generous, more giving, more, more caring than they actually were. Those are the exact sins that Ananias and Sapphira, did I mention that his name actually means gracious and hers beautiful? I love that. When they'd come to church, well, synagogue for them, or to the temple, they'd say, hey, gracious and beautiful, welcome. Well, they're no longer gracious or beautiful. They're rotting in, in, in the, the, the tomb. But nevertheless, um, at this point, he warns us, when we give, don't do it to be seen by men. He uses the word when again and again, and that reminds us that we're expected to be givers. Why? Because we serve and represent the greatest giver ever. A father who gave his only begotten son so we could live eternally, find forgiveness and everlasting life in him. A son who gave his life so, and shed his blood so we could be born again and forgiven every sin. It's so important that we become givers, but that we give not to be seen by men, but to be pleasing to him and to bring glory to him. He says, continuing on in Matthew 6, 3, when you give, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your giving may be in secret and your father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. Then he moves to prayer. When you pray, he will say, do not be like the hypocrites. He's saying, don't act out, don't play a part, don't pretend in your prayers. He says, they love to pray standing in the synagogues on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Listen, this subject of prayer is oh so essential because prayer is our most intimate time with the Father. It's our most intimate time with our Lord and Savior Jesus. It's a time where the Holy Spirit intercedes for us, working within us with giving groanings and utterances which cannot be uttered. So it's a time of intimacy with him. And, and, and to be doing that hypocritically as a show, as a pretense, hoping people will notice how we pray or what we pray, Man, nothing could be more offensive to the one we're praying to. Then in Matthew 16, 6, 6, 16, excuse me, moreover, when you fast. Now, we don't all fast because fasting is a spiritual thing. Fasting is depriving yourself physically in the natural of something in order to spend more time on spiritual things, the things that matter, the things that last. So while we don't all fast, lots of people diet. They're not even close to the same thing. They may both involve less food. But today, fasting from food may or may not be important to you. But fasting from media, absolutely essential. Why? Because our lives are dominated by screens, small and large, by audio that never stops, but we're bombarded 24 seven with information. Lots of it, not just, you know, foolish, unprofitable, but actually dangerous to us. We need to be in the word of God. And the more we're in the word, the less we'll be listening to the world. The more we're listening to the world, the less time for the word. And listen, we have to test all things according to the scriptures. So if you're young in this, get to know the word. If you're mature in this, stay in the word. And when someone says something to you that just isn't right, say, listen, that's not what the Bible says. Or you, when people accuse you of being this way or that way or say things that are just absolutely ridiculous about Christians, you need to lovingly correct them you need to humbly correct them because they're actually standing in their own way of coming to our Lord. 
Well, he says, when you fast, don't be like the hypocrites with the sad countenance. They disfigure their faces. Then again, they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your father who is in the secret place, and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. He affirms the action when you give, pray, fast, but he challenges them and us on our motivation. We'd be wise to do a self-test on this today. So first question would be, are you giving? Are you praying? Are you fasting? Is that a regular part of your lifestyle as a believer in Christ Jesus? Second question, when you give, pray, and fast, are you doing it to please God, to glorify God, to be a blessing to others, or to be seen of men? There's one more issue, and then I have a quick Well, a little project that you can do at home and should. Uh, This comes out of Mark 7, where the the Pharisees asked Jesus about his disciples' failure to wash their hands as they did. I, I shocked to say this is an issue today because hygiene is on the rise because of, well, the great pandemic that is taking so many lives. Their issue, though, wasn't so much hygiene. It had to do with the ceremonial washing about the way you went about it, the way you did it. That's important to us today because God's looking on the heart. We'll come back to that. It's something only he does. Well, anyway, Jesus answers them and says, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites? As it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts... Their hearts, their hearts are far from me. Brothers, sisters, it's not about what we say. It's about why we're saying it. What's going on in our hearts? But he does say out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. There's an overflow. So if I have a bitter heart, I'll be speaking bitter words. If I have a hostile, angry, unforgiving heart, I'll be speaking as if that were reality because whatever's going on within will manifest without. It's hypocritical to try to hide it. It's not hypocritical to confess it and ask forgiveness for it and ask God to give you power over it. He says, they honor me with their lips, but their heart is from me and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. I jotted just a few things to kind of get you started. This will be your homework for later. Next week, Lord willing, after we meet out in our parking lot, the high school group will be meeting for a short time over in Cap Calvary. Are we still on for that? Jared, awesome. Make sure if you're a high schooler tuning in, and I hope some high schoolers are tuning in, You'll want to pay attention next week, though, because Jared will have some questions for you and some things that you can talk about and pray about together. So so listen, here here are a few things to, to consider. We play the hypocrite, and playing the hypocrite is, is actually a pretty accurate way to say it since it's acting. Whenever we judge our brother or sister for not doing things the way we do them or did them, or think they should be done. We play the hypocrite whenever we judge our brother or sister for doing something we think they did, something we used to do, or something we'd never do. We play the hypocrite whenever we judge our brother or sister for doing something, but not really wanting to do it or not doing something, but actually wanting to do it. We play the hypocrite when we judge our brothers or sisters, when we judge their motives, as that's something only God can see. And actually, it's something only God can do because he alone looks on the heart and tests the motivations. 
We play the hypocrite whenever we judge at all, as only God is able to rightfully, righteously, and justly judge. Well, you can continue at home, expand the list, but remember, this is a self-test. You're to judge yourself and not your family, your friends, and certainly not your pastors. Well, where were we? I think we were all the way down to um, verse 12. So let's pick up there together. Back in Acts 5, chapter 5, verse 12. There are praise reports here following God's judgment of gracious and beautiful It says, through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly and believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Also, a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. This is oh so essential and important. God was doing things through them that were beyond unusual. They were signs pointing to our Lord. And they were wonders because they could not possibly happen unless God was working miraculously through those people. Now, there are things God enables us to do, and then he calls us to do them. But we don't ever want to judge what he might do in the future by what he's done in the past. I'm talking about in our lives personally. God may put me in a position, well, by this time of walking with him, he's put me in almost every possible position, at least conceivable positions, and some inconceivable positions. But he can put me in a position where there's a need that I'm clearly not fit to deal with. I'm clearly not someone who could help that person because, well, that's never happened in all these decades of walking with the Lord, at least not in my life. But listen, God can use anyone to do anything for anyone at any time. So I never want to look back to determine, what would you want me to do here, Lord? I just need to say, what would you, what do you want me to do here, Lord. Well, again, we see this. Satan's direct attack of persecution failed, as did his sneak attack of corruption. When he couldn't persecute the church into submission or running or fear, well, he tried to corrupt it. Both failed. And what Satan meant for evil, God meant for good. The sudden deaths, of two hypocrites, the couple formerly known as gracious and beautiful, now greedy and dead. They led to soul searching and fear among believers and unbelievers. But note this, having failed a second time, Satan doesn't give up. He returns to his earlier strategy and actually escalates the persecution. Well, And that brings us to verse 17. Then the high priest rose up and all those who were with him, which is of the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation. Yeah, we saw this earlier. It's a deja vu. I wish I could say it happens here and never again, but it will happen again and again and again and again and again. This will become their pattern. The disciples do good. The enemies of the disciples, fearing them, do evil. Well, they laid their hands on the apostles. They put them in the common prison. But at night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors, brought them out and said, go stand in the temple and speak to all the people, all the words of this life. And when they'd heard that, they entered the temple early in the morning and taught. 
But the high priest and those with him came and called the council together with all the elders of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought out. First surprise. They were freed and instructed by the angel to go into the temple courts and preach. And just as it had happened earlier, well, they're, they're going to be brought before the council. Again, the same gang that railroaded Jesus, that condemned an innocent man, that sent him to, to Pilate so that he could uh, order his crucifixion. This is the same group. The same people that tried Peter and John, well, not that long ago, and told them cease and desist or else. So first surprise, they're freed and they're instructed by the angel. Second surprise, when the officers came and did not find them in the prison, they returned and reported saying, indeed, we found the prison shut securely and the guards standing outside before the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. And when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priest heard these things, they wondered what the outcome would be. So one came and told them saying, look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. I wanna say no one could have been expecting that. Ordinarily, if prisoners escape, they run away and hide. These guys not only didn't escape, they were let out by an angel of the Lord. They were instructed by an angel of the Lord to do what Jesus already told them to spend their days doing. So they're right back where they were when they were arrested. They're doing just what they were doing when they were arrested. The only difference is when they go to find them in the prison, they're not there. They're out preaching and teaching preaching Jesus and teaching the word. Then the captain with the officers brought them without violence for they feared the people, lest they should be stoned. And when they brought them, they set them before the council and the high priest asked them saying, did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? It's a funny question. I would be like, did you really forget? Do you really not know? Anyway, look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. The answer to the first question is yes. You told us to cease and desist. The second and, and it's so radical. It says their statement, you filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. This is so important. Oh, that this could be said of us because this is success. They were to start in Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, then the uttermost parts of the world. But the mission is always at home first and sounds like missions being accomplished. They said, you have filled this city, our city, with your doctrine. The third thing, and it's radical, and you intend to bring this man's blood on us. You know, that's not at all what they're doing. Although these guys were guilty of the blood of Jesus, they were a part, some of them, of the trial, others of the mob. And, uh, and what did they cry out when Jesus was, was being offered by Pilate to, to, to let him go? And, and they said, his blood be upon us? and upon our children. They called a curse on themselves, and now they're saying, you're trying to bring this blood on us. But Peter and the other apostles said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Peter's absolutely consistent. And note, it's not just Peter and John. I mentioned last time, we know Peter's talking, but it sounded as if the two of them were both saying something. Now it sounds like a chorus Be because it says Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. I love that. The God of our fathers, Peter goes on to say, raised up Jesus whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. 
By the way, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. That's what we read. And Jesus took the curse upon himself when he died on Calvary's cross, when they took that beam and attached it to a tree and hung him there to die for our sins. So Peter and John are sharing, but others are joining the chorus. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. And God has exalted him to his right hand to be prince and savior. Prince of peace, savior of the world. To give repentance to Israel, forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses of these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Hey, we're getting close to the end of all this. So let me ask a question. Have you given your life to the Lord Jesus? And are you obeying him? Are you living in obedience to him? Living to please him by blessing people around you? When they heard this, they were furious and plotted to kill him. Back in verse 17, they were filled with indignation. Now it's overflowing. They're freaking out. They're furious. And they're saying, these guys got to die. Then one in the council stood up, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in respect by all the people and commanded to them to put the apostles outside for a little while. Listen, he will prove to be a bright light in a very dark place. He says to them, this is one of them speaking to the others of the men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what you intend to do regarding these men. For some time ago, Thutis rose up claiming to be somebody. A number of men, about 400 joined him. He was slain and all who obeyed him were scattered and came to nothing. After this, a man, Judas of Galilee, rose up in the days of the census and drew away many people after him. He also perished. And those who obeyed him were dispersed. Listen to his conclusion and carefully to mine. Now I say to you, keep away from these men. Let them alone. For if this plan or this work is of men, it will come to nothing. That's important for us because there are all sorts of people claiming to represent Jesus, false prophets, false Christ, false prophets. And, and, and it's so, so important that we realize if it's the work of men, it's gonna fail. But if it's the work of God, you can't overthrow it lest you even be found to fight against God. Listen, one of them respected by them stands before them filled not with indignation, not furious, not plotting and planning to execute these men for simply obeying the Lord who they claim to be serving. No, he is filled with the wisdom of God. He is filled with the goodness and the, and the grace of God. They agreed with him. You think that would lead to, all right, set them free. It says when they called for the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Last time they threatened them, this time they beat them. That's important to us. Because what's happening is the persecution and the intensity of it is ramping up. It will go from telling them to cease and desist to beating them and telling them to cease and desist to actually murdering some of them, martyring some of them and telling them to cease and desist. Well, in any case... They commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and they let them go. So they departed from the presence of the council and they rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, 
they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Persecution, corruption, temptation, none of that can stop God from accomplishing his will, his way, his plan through his people. But we need to be on guard. We are in the midst of one of the greatest spiritual battles of our lives. And while many are concerned about the pandemic, and we should be, we need to realize the enemy's strategy, the enemy of our soul's strategy, is to divide and conquer. So the time where we gather together and it's quickly approaching will be an opportunity to love one another. And here's his command, our Lord's command, love one another as I've loved you. We're going to need a lot of grace. We're going to need to be merciful and patient and kind and loving and caring to people who don't see eye to eye with us and yet are a part of the same body that God has made us a part of. To that end, I'm very happy to say next week we'll be looking at the body of Christ in our next chapter as we see how God used individuals different from one another, gifted unlike one another to accomplish his perfect will in that day and how that should play out in ours. So Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for this oh so clear time in your word together where there's not one thing we can't grasp and understand or apply or make sense of or pass on to others. But more than anything else, Lord, I pray that those of us who are playing a part, who are posing as Christians, those who are so far gone that they actually believe they are, and yet they've never really surrendered their lives to you, that, Lord, you'd bring them to repentance, that you would shake them today out of their, their delusion that knowing all about you is the same as knowing you, that knowing things about you is the same as serving you, that saying I'm a believer in Jesus is the same as being alive forever in him, forgiven every sin. And right now, wherever you are, whoever you are, if you're a believer in Jesus, live your life for him. Dig into the word, turn off the TV, turn off the internet, get away from your cell phone, find a quiet place, spend time with the Lord. Read his word, pray and wait for him to answer. You need his guidance, his direction, his wisdom. You wanna be like the one in that crowd that stood and said, listen to me. And then you share what's true from the word of God. If you've never given your life to Jesus, you may know everything about him or you may only know what I'm telling you today. You can be sure of this though. You're a guilty sinner and the wages of sin is death and the gift of God, everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. I offer to you what was offered to me. And, and the moment I gave my life to the Lord, my life began to change. And I, I've never looked back with any regret except this one, that I didn't do it sooner. So I ask you today, if you haven't given your life to Jesus, do it now. Pray these words after me. Open your heart to the Lord Jesus. Pray this, Jesus, thank you for loving me, for coming to earth, for becoming one of us, for living among us, for dying for us. Thank you for loving me and dying for my sins. You gave your life for me, so I give my life to you. Take control transform me forgive me every sin and every hypocrisy especially 
And then, Lord, use me to glorify you and bring others to faith in you. In your precious name, Jesus, amen. If you prayed that prayer, get in touch with us. We want to get in touch with you. Let your friends, your family, your neighbors know we're going to be gathering in our parking lot. Plenty of room. You're going to love it. No child care. The children will be with us. Just want to remind you, bring them, but be prepared to keep them by your side at all times. God bless you guys. Let's worship our Lord one more time together.